Well, hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to our show. It's a beautiful Monday. And uh, today I have a special pleasure to have with me Lionel and another guy. The other guy happens to be one of the developers that's working on uh, Cinema 4D simulation and Pyro. So you're going to have an opportunity to ask your questions right at, uh, what's it called, uh, the horse's mouth. Get your answers from the horse's mouth. And uh, welcome to our company, Max, and welcome, uh, Lionel. Hello. Hello. Yep, uh, developers um, speak many languages, but uh, very few words. So I'm going to start with the housekeeping and uh, the, the usual uh, ritual, and uh, then we're going to get right into it. Just a reminder, please preface any questions with capitalized the word question, so we can uh, tell the difference between general comments, uh, compliments towards myself, and all that stuff, and uh, actual questions. So let me share my screen and begin the housekeeping. Um, go to the maxon.net uh, events page to see any events that are happening now, uh, happened in the past or happening in the future, online, um, in, in person, and all that. It's got a lot of information, and you will find amazing things over here. Don't forget that these videos, if you don't catch them live, uh, which in this particular case are on the Maxon YouTube channel, on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel, if you want to watch them recorded with timestamps and all that, kindly um, put together uh, by Dr. Sassy, um, you can go to the Maxon, Maxon Training Team YouTube channel and uh, please uh, subscribe and um, uh, turn on notifications uh, so that you get all the information. And uh, you will find all sorts of interesting stuff here, including quick tips and, and all that. And don't forget, starting in December, we have three weeks of mechanical rigging. So, Max on YouTube channel, go to the ZBrush YouTube channel and see all the amazing content that people are making. And learn how to use ZBrush and call yourselves artists. If you want to become a certified Cinema 4D Pro user or a certified trainer, go to the certification page. Click down here. Click on the certification link, uh, tip, the topics. I can't even read today. Woke up too early. And uh, the topics here will give you an overview of what's required if you decide to take the test. But at the same time, it will be a good idea for everyone to go through these and see uh, what are the topics uh, that uh, we at Maxon consider the most important ones to get you started and going with uh, Cinema 4D. And of course, uh, to show our gratitude for you participating in our shows for the month of November, please go to the Maxon merch store. And this is the link over here, which you will find in the chat and use Maxon Simulation, one word, all caps as the password. You only pay for package and folding, as I say. Everything else is free. And finally, don't forget to go to uh, the new university or even the old university. And the new university is university.maxon.net, where you're going to find um, hundreds of tutorials. And the old university has thousands of tutorials, which uh, most of them are still relevant to this date. And uh, yeah, I think that that's all I have to say about housekeeping. And I'm going to pass the knowledge baton to my very good friend, uh, Max, uh, which happens to be um, uh, a great human being as well. And uh, he always <laughs> replies politely, politely to me. Either he has a tendency to you know, withstand my constant question assaults, uh, but he's always responsive and very polite. If that's not how you feel, Max, uh, thank you anyway for tolerating me. So um, what uh, are you going to show us? Are you ready? Can we share your screen? Yeah, I think it's fine. OK. So, uh, oh. I will show some very basic scenes. Well, not basic, basic scenes, some more or less advanced workflows. workflows to work with colliders, and also some two-way interaction between cloth and rigid bodies and pyro, and also some more explanation of what actually these advanced settings in this submenu mean. 
because those I feel like are the least explained or least known settings, and they still can be very powerful in certain situations. Mm. So let's assume we just have a normal pipe, which was I think created by a sweep object and has actually volume, so it's a double-sided or like a two-sided collider, double-sided collider, and we want to let the pyro volume expand from this little sphere here all the way to the top. If you would use the default settings for this, it will most likely fail immediately and not really spread all the way up. In this scene that I prepared already, I did change some settings to make it work that it reaches, I mean, the top in, let's say, 30, uh, three seconds. And my approach would be the following. First of all, I have a uh, this sphere. Why is it not showing the handles? Oh, whatever. Here we go. I have the pyrotech on top of it. And the only thing I emit here would be the density, which just adds it every second of the value 5. And the fuel, which I set to frame range fluid, fuel set to 15. And I enable this little checkbox, which is also quite important, which is called constant pressure. What this means is that instead of actually emitting fuel here, it will start by emitting pressure. And by emitting pressure, I more or less mean that it kind of just tries to expand from this point onwards, no matter what the velocity is. So if I just step, let's say, one frame forward and another frame forward, we can see that it already expanded quite a bit in just three frames mainly coming from this constant pressure and some more advanced settings that I will go into a bit. If I don't do this at all, nothing would happen. The smoke would just stay at the one position and not do anything. Now, enabling this again, also, this doesn't really matter. It's just from frame zero to some max number, so I constantly emit the pressure. I could also limit it to just 15 frames, but in this case, I don't want this to happen. And noise, this is actually almost default value. It's just a bit of changes which don't really matter that much. I feel like you could also turn the noise off and it would work just as well. And I'm just going to let it run a bit, starting from zero. And now you can see that it expands quite well. I'll also turn off the sweep in this case. And it expands quite quickly. And this is thanks to some of the advanced settings that I set, which I will show now in a bit, or well, now. First of all, well, this is not an advanced setting, it's just a default setting here of the substeps, which I set to five, so it's not quite a default, because if this was zero, you would see that it would not really work, mainly because the velocity is way too high at this point, and you need to kind of subdivide the time into more steps, so yeah, you get rid of the stepping artifacts, which loses a lot of accuracy and density. Similarly, this might work. If you increase the padding a bit, it will look a bit better, but still ultimately fails. So at least having some soft steps here is important. Five might be a bit too much. It might also work with three, which would then overall improve performance as well. But yeah, that's something you can play around with. Max, uh, can, course, I, can I, can yeah. I in interrupt you one second? Um, I have a question, which I haven't asked you. I'm going to ask you here. We know that when we're doing cloth simulations, increasing the substeps, changing how the cloth behaves. Do we have a similar uh, side effect in uh, when, it, when we increase yeah. the substeps? It always changes the look of the simulation. Okay. Same with voxel size. This is something which is not avoidable, but also substeps. Thank you. So usually what you... well. I'm not 100% sure. Usually, I think what the workflow should be is first to keep the voxel size fixed. Except, well, you, you kind of should target, oh, I want this amount of resolution, and then I try to work around that. Except if you work with uh, the uppressing feature, which we just added recently, which might alleviate that issue. But also, substeps should more or less be very consistent. Darren just got here. Hello, Darren. OK. Anyways, substeps usually help when the fluid is moving very fast. And in this case, since I emit a lot of pressure here, you need to 
some subs, uh, at, at some sub steps. But this is not all that I changed for the scene. Okay, just smaller changes. I turned off vorticity, I turned off turbulence, so we have a cleaner motion. Also just turned off gravity, so there's no other external forces in this case. And fuel combustion doesn't matter, it's turned off. I had a bit of density smoothing, so it looks a bit nicer, which doesn't really matter that much. And now most importantly, I ticked staggered velocities. This is also a setting which will change to look a lot, will be a bit more computational heavy and also use a bit more VRAM, but it helps a lot when working with colliders and cloth simulations and stuff like that. Because this way, more or less, um, the collider is discretized a bit more accurate, which leads to better effects usually. I mean, in this case, it looks very similar. Okay, it looks actually pretty similar. I had some cases before where I think I had turbulence and vorticity, and then it actually started bleeding through the collider, which of course is not a desirable effect. But usually this is the way to go, especially when you have moving colliders. I guess for static ones, taking it off also works, but I would usually recommend the setting if you have any two-way or one-way moving interaction. Okay, so of course I need to restart the simulation. And well, the attraction mode doesn't really matter. This is also just for accuracy reasons. If I would, for example, turn off this, then the velocity attraction would use the semi-Lagrangian method, which would be more accurate and maybe have some more smooth result in the end. So I'll just let this run. And now we come to the pressure solver. This is more or less the setting which changes the whole look of this part of the simulation. In here, in this submenu, they're sorted from least accurate but fastest to most accurate but slowest. If I would choose Gauss Seidel in this instance, yeah, it spreads way smaller and it looks very smooth and not really behaves in any shape or form like a fluid should or a smoke cloud should. And at some point it will also just fail and not reach the end of the pipe. Mainly because this 50 iterations more or less means, oh, it only goes 50 boxes in each direction. And then this pressure, which is defined, uh, oh, yeah, I'm not drawing that, which is at the bottom, will not be showing anymore. That will not be transmitted all the way. The same, let's say, if I have multigrid with zero polish iterations, this is a bit slower and uh, has a bit more global behavior, but ultimately will still fail. Now, adding some Polish iterations would alleviate that again, but still not lead to the same nice results that we just saw with the preconditioned conjugate gradient. This still spreads quite nicely, but also doesn't achieve the same what this method does. As you can see, this is obviously a lot slower, but it kind of makes up for it by actually solving the issue at hand. I can also quickly show the velocity. So this is the velocity of the simulation. And you can see how, well, let me actually show pressure. Ooh, no. OK, I'll show it in another scene quickly. But this is basically the pressure of the simulation after the solve. Yeah. I'll, I'll show the other scene. I think that will show it better. But in the end, this pressure solver mode is basically what makes the whole system work. And since this one has more or less the least or the smallest error, it will work for such global effects where you just try to push something through a tube or something. For free flowing clouds and smoke, it might not be as required because there the error of margin is a bit larger and you don't actually need this effect in the end. When you're kind of done, I got this cached result. Oh, I have this cache result here. So in the end, it would actually come out at the top and then be normal again. Now you already see there's an issue with the blockiness here, which mainly comes from the base resolution of the simulation and the interacting with the collider because the density boxes are very dense there and then they're filled completely and the way it's rendered will kind of form these cube-like artifacts here. And for that, I use this upress active cache function 
to increase the resolution by a factor of two in every dimension, which is overall an effective resolution of eight to create this cache here, which takes a bit to load because the velocity field is huge. I'll take this but time just to remind everyone. Very smooth. Remind everyone that in order to get your up resing to work, you always need velocity. If you don't have velocity in your cache grid, the up resing will not work. That's, yes. I think, the most crucial part, if I'm not mistaken, Max. Yeah. It's only the velocity which has to be there, mm -hmm. which should be an export and mask velocity should be turned off. Else uh -huh. it work as well. That's this a good should tip. Definitely be off. And well, in the end, these two simulations now don't look one to one the same. As you can see, this simulation is a bit further ahead than this one. But at least here, you don't see any artifacts of the collider discretization here. At least also, well, at some point, the frame is a bit different when the smoke starts coming out the top, uh, which I think mainly comes from the density diffusion parameter or smooth factor, because that's very hard to translate to uh, an uprest simulation. But yeah, in the end, the main advantage is that loading the grids takes a long time, um, is that these artifacts are gone and the resolution is slightly higher. Yeah. So this is the basis of this scene. And I also just, if you, now you didn't have any color information, for example, but I also have one replay with the color information because you can just, so, stylize your smoke however you want. And this I just now rendered on a redshift with like a glass pipe. And it looks almost the same as the lowest resolution. Maybe not one to one the same because that's usually very difficult with upres um, techniques of the simulation. And actually it kind of leaves at the same time here, but the smoke is very, very thin compared to the original simulation, and that's why it looks a bit different. One more trick I'd like to show with a similar scene, just close this, is this one, where there's one more trick uh, to kind of make also other solvers work, mainly through the method of more substeps. A lot of more substep might help. And I just have a cube here to kind of predefine my domain. So let's assume I don't have any, well, this is more or less of a workaround to say, oh, I only want to simulate in this area. Well, let's assume I don't use any temperature, so I just want to simulate the smoke. Then I can set the small uh, temperature to be in this cube at some value, which should be activating the simulation, which will look in the initial frame something like this. I don't really care. Well, you see here the discretization of the collider where there's uh, basically a collider in the way. But now this will make it so the whole domain here is already being drawn, uh, simulated. So it's basically making a dense simulation out of a sparse simulation to restrict the domain. If I now um, only draw the density, which I'm actually interested in this case, It's a lot slower than before because now everything will be simulated even though there's no velocity. But this way I can more or less control where it's supposed to be simulated. And maybe if there's some artifacts arising from this from this padding here, it is fixed by this. Um, and now also this method might actually, well, it's still a considerably slower than the other one, but actually might lead to better results. So, so probably. Well, no, okay, it's still the same. Yeah, so I kind of just predefined the domain. And why I wanted to show it here is actually also to show the difference between this one. So if I show the pressure, this is the, okay, let me maybe reset it to default. Uh, reset to default, just to show the difference between the default and some slightly adjusted settings. And you can see how far this parameter kind of spreads per time step. 
it's not very far. If I set it to this, well, I can increase this a bit, maybe these simulation, uh, these iterations. Still doesn't really work that well. And there's also some artifacts at the back here. If I now go with the original server, which usually has the highest accuracy, in one step, it is already way farther along the pipe. And that's why there's more accurate velocities inside of this domain, and the fluid will reach the top more easily. If I go with density again, yeah, no, just after four frames, it's already here. So these settings are the most important ones when dealing with a few more complex and close domains, especially. You can also try to turn this one off again. And maybe here it actually fails. But if it also works, it's also not bad. But especially, I think, with moving colliders, it doesn't respect the velocity of the colliders that well. Of course, now it's a lot slower than before because it's up to nine sub-steps compared to five before. So at least computation-wise, it's twice the amount. We can also take actually the more powerful GPU and disable the drawing and then just show it here. Yeah. So we have a couple of uh, questions, Max, all right. if you may. Yes. All right. I'm popping it up. So uh, Joaquin says, hello, I have questions about the scales of simulations, how to make a simulation look faster or slower depending on the scale. So I guess, you know, match stick, small simulation, uh, building burning, large simulation, other than using real uh, units. Uh, is there any suggested uh, method? To make smaller simulations look faster. Um, well, I think usually if you just kind of mid more velocity or faster velocity, you can always pre process and scale down the volumes. How does the time scale affect the actual simulation? Um, that, would that give us you know, a well, the time, that. yeah, the time scale definitely. I mean, I can. In the end, what this just does is um, instead of multiplying, let's say, the velocity with one, it just multiplies it by a factor of two when doing the advection step, and then kind of moves twice as fast in a frame or in a sub step. So we can say, to a certain degree, increasing the time scale makes your simulation look slightly smaller. I would say if if by faster simulation it should look smaller than or if a faster simulation is looking smaller than yes but right. i mean there's also other factors to that oh that yeah yeah speed. Uh, density amounts and all that and, uh, you yeah know, you can't have a little puff of smoke that has huge density so you have to make your density less and and all that um yeah. hopefully you can work in that direction uh again and uh, if i set it to 0 0.5 for example that's Let's say if I go with 30 FPS and one, it's kind of the same at 0 0.5 time scale, then it's kind of the same as 60 FPS with one time scale. And let's say zero sub steps. Then it kind of moves exactly, well, not quite. No, well, no, not quite. Never mind that. That was, <laughs> was stupid. <laughs> right, we have another question. Uh, all right, let's read it. Um, Okay, I think the answer is yes, but let's see. Hi guys, is it possible to use the velocity and or pressure parameters that you just mentioned and shade them according to the different velocities pressures when rendering? So what I would assume this means, and please uh, correct me in the chat, uh, Mr. Works, um, you want to be able to get the velocities, which is a vector, it's got three components, and use that as color. I would assume something like that. Um, but also the pressure, I guess the pressure would just be a mapping from a yes. float to a gradient. True, yeah. Uh, pressure is uh, just the uh, black and white, whereas velocity is, let's say, RGB. It's got three components. So I guess if I have the, the shader, I could, of course, just write velocity here instead of the density, or in the color channel, I can write velocity, but then it will just take the raw value. So you probably have to scale it somehow inside of the shader itself, because right. else it's pretty much quickly black or white. Or, well, I guess 
Mm. You could build something custom with a volume builder and then rescale it in there, but that would require duplication or duplicate uh, pyro objects. But the general consensus is that because it's just volumetric data, both the pressure and the velocity, it's just either a vector grid or a fog grid. Because by the way, for anyone that doesn't know, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, density, they're all just fog volumes, nothing else. It's what values they have that make them look, uh, uh, what they look like. Um, and then we have uh, the pressure, which is a uh, vector volume. So it's all a standardized uh, type of uh, volume. But uh, Mr. Works, you can start from there. Try and see if there are any uh, combinations you can do and any remapping or stuff like that. And uh, yeah, um, if you try it now, let us know if it worked. Basil, Basil is in the yeah, I just in the saw chat. It. Yeah, <laughs> Basil is an another developer from Maxon, uh, working on the simulation system. And uh, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't know. He's referring to something, uh, probably in <laughs> a developer joke. Yeah. Not Which, important right now. <laughs> not important right now. You know, when you hear that, that is very important. They're just saying. Just saying. <laughs> what else do you have? Show us more. Show us more. Um, let's let's go with this one first. I can disable. Well, maybe just uh, plain. Are we going to show interaction of uh, cloth and pyro? And rigid bodies in this case. And rigid bodies. With just cubes. I mean, that's a simple shape. But cubes. if it's always a convex shape, then of course it's fine. Oh, we uh, have someone else from the Maxim team, <laughs> my friend Basti. So a, a bit, uh, I need to give some information to everyone. When you read the comments from developers and um, uh, product managers and all that, read them very, very closely. That's all I have to say. That doesn't uh, impinge on my NDA. All right, go ahead. All right, so in this setup, let me just turn off rigid bodies quickly, and I just have a sphere again with some few settings, where I again emit constant pressure just to create some sort of explosion effect. Oh, that's... oh I cannot do that. Okay, I need to actually disable the rigid body. So it's just doing like a one frame explosion, which does look a bit noisy because it's just two high velocities, but in the end, kind of results in this kind of smoke cloud. That's how you make a brain. Mm -hmm. That's it. That was a tip. How to, <laughs> how to model a brain using Pyro. And let me just mesh it, and then it looks exactly like one. Uh, density. Hello. One frame. Why does it not mesh it? Here we go. Well, you, you can't use that language, Max. <laughs> Which language? <laughs> Okay, anyways, <laughs> if I now enable the rigid body again, it looks like the following. Why is it not doing anything? One second. Uh, rigid body. Is your viewport working? Yeah, that's working. Just do it like this. I think it's maybe I still need to keep the cloth around. Okay, so this is not a frame of the explosion. So right now nothing happened because the power simulation is executed after the rigid bodies. Now the next frame, they should get a velocity from this and slowly start moving. And then finally kinda throw away uh, fly away with a realistic looking behavior in all directions, the way the explosion force was. Inter, uh, interacting with the rigid bodies. It was reworked a bit in dot one or dot zero, this fluid force factor to be a bit more intuitive and to work a bit better because before it was a bit weak. Right now, let's say I have it at one. The rigid bodies don't really move a lot. They are barely being moved in any direction, just a bit to the side. Now, if I do it to a hundred, 
they fly off stronger as before because before it was a 10. But at least they're not flying away into infinity, which was kind of the effect it was before because it was very mess dependent. And now the mess is just 10 and overall works a lot more intuitive. That, that is a tip that I, I always have, uh, have to say because um, when you have interacting uh, objects, if it's one object by itself, a piece of cloth or some pyro and all that, uh, mass doesn't really matter. But when objects are interacting with each other, especially different types of objects, a rope with a cloth, with um, uh, pyro simulation, with rigid body and all that, make sure your masses um, are, uh, you know, tuned to the right value. Um, Max, do you have any advice as far as <clears throat> how is mass uh, controlled in terms of numbers? If you have a rope and you have a cloth, do they both need to have a mass of one? Or do we need to think of different ratios if you want them to interact, let's say properly, a normal, you know, a sheet, um, a, a bed sheet and a, a piece of, uh, you know, rope. Um, if we use the, the default values for mass, is that interaction going to be okay? Or do we need to change something maybe in the rope or the cloth to make them look more natural? It depends on the resolution of the measures you're using. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, the mass for the cloth and the rope, as far as I know, is going to be distributed on all the points. So let's say if you have 100 points, every single point will get a mass of 0 0.01 if you have a mass of 1. Oh, so it's equivalent. As as all right. This is very interesting information. So, so just like with cloth simulation, where you need to, um, to, to change the stiffness of the cloth, you can do it using sub-steps. Here we have something equivalent, that if your rope and your cloth have more points than each point to point a collision because that's how the simulation works will have different uh, a different result because the masses are different depending on the polygon count uh, that is very interesting thank you well depending on the point count mainly on the, on the point count yeah don't matter that much but yeah so i guess usually if you have a high res mesh you want to increase the mass as well a bit especially i guess when interacting with rigid bodies because there, the mass is a bit differently defined, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, the rigid body, I think it's, it's I think per it's, object. Uh, for rigid yeah. bodies, bodies, it's the mass is per object, yeah. whereas for simulations and ropes, it's per point. Well, well, not per point, it's the number of points. You divide uh, the, the mass by the number of points, and you get the mass per point. Yeah. I guess you can also have the mass map. Is there such a thing? Yeah. Yep. And you can define a different mass depending on where it is in the object, in case you want some parts of it heavier. Excellent. All Please right. continue. Um, well, that's about it with this scene. If there's no question, it just shows some interaction with mainly the rigid bodies here, which then just fly off and also intersect with the cloth and, of course, go through because they're just too fast. But also, as you can see here, the cloth kind of moves up here and drags the pyro or the smoke behind it. Note that uh, all the scenes I'm more or less showing are with the staggered velocities turned on. Okay, and also turn it off, which should still look similar. Yeah. But different behavior. I mean, that's just, I guess, also in some way, whatever you would prefer. But, yeah. And the, the density or the temperature doesn't affect the... Uh, the velocities of the other objects. It's just the velocity itself. Just the velocity yeah. again. Just yes. the velocity. Okay, so, you know, uh, it may feel intuitive that if you take the density and make it less and the temperature and make it less, uh, that, that directly affects how these uh, forces are going to be applied to cloth and all that. But in fact, velocity is controlled by the density and the temperature, and those velocities will affect your objects. Yeah. In the end, what is kind of assumed in the simulation is that everywhere is the same air density of approximately one kilogram per liter, right? I think that's the density. And the fluid is just defined, or the air is just defined by the velocity. And then that's the force acting on other objects. The density and temperature are just quantities which are dragged along and can in turn via, for example, the density buoyancy and temperature buoyancy interact or affect the velocity of the fluid of the air, which usually goes, oh, if you have a higher fluid, then hot air rises and 
density it's the other way around if it's let's say 20 then it means oh density if, it, if there's more density in the air it will kind of fall yeah that's it's one of those funny things where that's how it is in nature uh, dust and smoke are heavier than air so they fall down the reason why dust and smoke usually go upwards is because there's an updraft either because of temperature or something like that so small particles have they react to gravity uh, and they go downwards that's why the density buoyancy is a positive number well um, usually it's a default i think is negative uh, negative sorry because gravity really needs to pull it push it in the, the opposite direction whereas fire being uh, hot uh, it, it naturally goes because of its natural buoyancy upwards so that's why you you need to use a, a positive value one thing that is also possible if I just have like a simple setup where say I have this kind of temperature but if the for example the temperature dissipates quicker than the density and the density would actually fall like it, how it's supposed to then there is like an initial boost oh well, it's too high this part let me also increase the temperature a bit let's see okay now it's counteracting it even correctly so at the first it rises and then if the temperature slowly okay I need a few more frames and not have any density dissipation then in theory wherever there's density at some point it should start falling again when there's not enough temperature to kind of counteract the force but does it yeah up here there's no kind of the turning point where it slowly comes around oh that's nice it, you can make it starts falling pyroclastic cloud that way where it explodes and then it sort of falls downwards and chases yeah. people usually you do need some fuel with it at least to also push it upwards or let it burn a bit so it's actually very hot and yeah beautiful you could do. let me just turn off yeah well that's the behavior of the buoyancy so they were kind of counteracting by if you, they're both positive but yeah just this let me just rerun it quickly yeah and here it slowly falls down again yeah by the way max what is the configuration of your computer just because someone is going to ask and i'm just the... okay i have one 3060 rtx yep. and one amd pro w6800 oh so you have a terrible computer and yet it works quite well good Good. That's, Why? Good no. that's not terrible this is this is very good. i mean <laughs> don't take it personally i i i say these things to bug people you know this is 32 gigabyte of memory which is great for the simulation yeah, yeah. just saying <laughs> oh and my cpu is also not bad but yeah anyways um yeah this is the basis of these parameters Yes. Okay. Now, just for the collisions again of two cloth or of cloth and pyro this time, I have one mesh which has a mass of 10, the other one with a mass of 1, the right one in this case, and just some velocity coming from the bottom, and this one will be kind of dragged with it, whereas the other one just kind of floats in it, it doesn't really attract that much. So this is kind of the mass ratio in this case, which you can visualize easily here. And this one keeps spinning around because it's pinned here and just, it's not really a feedback loop, but it, yeah, <laughs> just keeps spinning. Hmm. So you can Puppet see here, mission. Of... sorry, what? Yeah, you got a perpetual motion. It could be a machine. <laughs> <laughs> Perpetu mobile, yes. But you see as uh, how it kind of drags the, the smoke also a bit behind it. If I, let me see if this now actually does change it, if I use the normal velocities. It doesn't drag it as well. It still interacts somewhat correctly. But now it doesn't have that nice effect on the cloth, uh, on the smoke itself or the pyrophore itself of dragging the small cloud behind it. I hope it's visible here. 
So this is where this uh, setting kind of can shine. All right. Okay. Also, I always like to use a destructor to kind of limit the domain so it doesn't grow infinitely. And using this invert function, you can also say, oh, I just want parts of my domain up here to say like, I don't know, like this. And then it will continue onwards just in this part of the domain. And it's kind of a or or like a union between the two destructors. Yeah, that is cool. That is cool. When are we going to get a sculptable uh, destructor? Anyway, you can disregard that question. Objection, <laughs> I hear. I mean, there's always, <laughs> always at least for this, the trick with the negative density of the pyrimeter. We just have yeah, a cube. Yeah. I think this is also always kind of under the radar. If I do uh, just a huge value here, it will be clamped to zero internally. Now I just have a torus in here. And here it will just cut out the density and the temperature and just set it to zero. If you turn off the torus, we'll be able to see it because it's fancy. Oh, oh right. It's volume. just the surface if I do volume. Exactly. Yeah. And it just cuts it out here. Yeah, this so is what I find amazing. It's so easy mm. to sculpt your pyro and make any kind of shape uh, you, you want. And uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you something that very few people know. So uh, hang in there, call your friends and family, because you're going to see more interesting stuff. Right. I have just one more quick um, scene to show regarding particle action. Just close all the other scenes. So I just have a standard emitter here. Let me just uh, disable the field force, disable the emitter. Then I just have a normal smoke plume here that just slowly rises. Or well, again, temperature bloom, I guess. And now I want to advect, this, for example, some particles with it. And the way to do it usually is with the field force. Let me just increase the velocity here as well. And usually if you just slap it in the scene and you have the pyro output here, you of course want the velocity channel and uh, the velocity channel only enabled, so it can actually set the velocity correctly. And what I did differently in this setup is um, actually I can maybe add at least the field force from scratch. So the basis of this setup is that it can actually move the particles when they're inside of the volume already, and that it kind of sets it directly is all working by the field force. But there's a few caveats that you have to be careful about. Um, first of all, here in this uh, field list, I want to use the velocity. So I have one pyro output basically giving me the velocity that I can drag in here. As you can see now, the values that are generated are way too huge, which usually uh, can be changed in the following, where you can click on this, enable remapping, and you need to turn off this um, remapping of the direction to no remap. And then just turn it off again. And now it's, well, I can also show it without this. What will happen is that it will just, as soon as it reaches this, it should explode. No, wait. Well, it doesn't explode anymore, I guess. But if I disable this, ah, now it should just, they're just flying away. So that's why we need to do the no remap here and also turn it off again just so it has the correct velocities. And wait, ah, now I do add velocity and five. Need to, for example, do this. Why is it? Okay. Now the issue is they will only get the velocity that is set in this area here. If I draw the pyro scene, I can see that there's basically no velocity there. No matter how high I draw this multiplier for the velocity, there's nothing here. If I drag the emitter over here, then it would actually start mo moving with the velocity. Wait, I think. Why is the cloud not moving? Sorry. Oh, I forgot something. Right. <laughs> Whenever you add a field force, you need to add it to the exclusion list if you use the velocity of the pyro. 
mm. output. Right, I forgot. Not you get lost a feedback. Just, Otherwise, you yeah. get a feedback. Yeah, lost velocity feedback again. Okay, okay. Yeah. So now it's actually the correct behavior. And now, if I just keep it in here, you see it actually. Wait, let me just turn off all this cluttering effects. You see that the particles that are spawned are actually moving with the cloud. You see this nice rotation here of this vortex, and it works one to one with it. This is the advantage of set absolute velocity with a strength of one. Now, just the issue with this kind of setup is if the particles start moving from the outside of the volume, they don't do anything because the velocity is zero here. And it, well, it's not quite zero. They will slowly be dragged in here and then go upwards, but it will take quite some time. And the way to improve this is um, you can have a follow for the field force in here. And this now will download the density of the power simulation, use it as a fall off. And now basically only where there's density, the field force will actually activate with the particles and then it will set the velocity and then they start moving with it. That's genius. Yes. Why didn't I think about it? Lionel, no. why didn't you think about it? <laughs> no, we're thinking just, the same thing. Mm. I'm supposed to know these things. Now just one issue here is um, it will actually go out on the top. It doesn't follow it one to one, the movement anymore. So maybe if there was like some way to say, oh, activate this particle, then now it would move it maybe in TP or something. So it doesn't, yeah, work all the way. But this is one thing. And maybe one thing that you need to do here is just a small formula where you can say, oh, if it's larger than zero, then uh, B1. Right. Now you're just showing off, Max. OK, keep yeah. going. <laughs> Because okay. else I'm not sure if it actually multiplies with the density, right? In the fall off. And like this, it just says, oh, either it's one or zero, the strength. But I think it's the same either way, where there's density. Can't you use a field just to mask the, the volume above? Above where they enter. Oh, no, because you have set absolute velocity. OK. Hmm. Yeah, but I could, I think, if I do a linear field. You can mask the density, for example using a spherical just uh, of, oh, a linear field, yeah. What if I do it like this? Does this work? That it's just one above here now? Then it should be transported correctly, right? Or Yeah, there now, you go. Right. now we're getting yeah. this yeah. Right. Oh, right. At least I, so, I look a bit smarter now. Good. <laughs> so this is the, so the most important things for this is to shortly enable remapping, disable the direction remapping, and then disable it again. Yeah, which is a bit unfortunate, but this is currently the way to get the correct velocity values of the power simulation interacting with the sim uh, with the particles. Well, I mean, clicking a couple of buttons, uh, yeah. I don't think it's, a, it's such a big deal. But it, uh, other than that, it's a, it's a very easy way to get a proper particle advection. And then you can use MoGraph on the particles and put little, um, yeah. you know, uh, little cloners on it, multi-instance them, colorize them and uh, make your little flying embers. Exactly. So now this looks kind of out of the box. I mean, instead of the density, you could also use the temperature, but it really doesn't matter in this case. As you see, it just transports it with the cloud or with I the love, smoke, with the I plume. I mean, here it already dissipates, but now with the linear field, it just works. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, so cool. Mm. Let's see if we have any questions. We don't have any questions. People are just mesmerized with uh, your presentation. So uh, here is where I try to see if people are paying attention. Would uh, uh, we, I need people to reply. I need at least, uh, let's say, uh, 10 replies. Would you like to see uh, a trick how you can art direct volumes? Uh, Hannah uh, sending a compliment. Um, Hannah is our um, a certified trainer from uh, Hamburg, and um, uh, she frequents us, and she's on uh, backstage as well. And uh, he says, um, very helpful and fantastic tips. Yes, fantastic tips, and very helpful. Let's see. So does anyone want to see something that has to do with volumes and pyro? If I don't get 10 replies, I'm not going to show it. There you go. I Everyone's going to pay for it. You, all right. Lionel. This doesn't count. <laughs> Lionel's vote counts. Uh, Hannah, that's two votes. 
let's see what we're going to get. In the meantime, let me go through the questions here, see if we have anything else. No, we don't have any. Let me go up. Yeah, we don't have any other questions. Yes, please, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Anyway, I'm going to show you. Right? Even if Oh, we have more. Yes, we're getting votes. The votes are coming in. OK, so let me, <laughs> let me share my screen. Now, what I'm going to show is a, where's my screen? Oh, I need to find, my screen is supposed to be on, but on my feedback, oh, um, I think Kyle has, uh, oh, there's something where there are three invisible little uh, names there. Anyway, um, so let me, let me show you something that may interest you. Um, I'm going to get a little text and extrude it. And that's not what I'm going to show. I'm just going to make it a bit thicker uh, to make it interesting. Okay. So we're under the general impression is that if you want to use the volume, the Redshift volume shader to uh, uh, create pyro, uh, you actually need to create pyro. So you would take this, you would add a pyro and, and whatnot. But there is a way where you can create manually a, uh, a volume, uh, a volume set actually that contains temperature and density and whatever else you need um, in a very specific way. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a volume builder. In order to create your uh, faux pyro, uh, it needs to be set to fog. Um, SDFs are for creating surfaces predominantly. So leave it at fog. Let's put this at two. And here is a, a fog volume, right? And of course, you can do some shenanigans. Um, the, the particular one is I like to add a, a group field and uh, set this, let's say, to multiply, go to the group field and add some sort of random uh, and make sure that under the volume builder, it's set to select this and go to objects below. And now you can um, create your little noise, my favorite noise. Anyone that knows me knows. See, I do puns without knowing. So, um, and finally, let's see over here. Uh, I'm going to leave this at one. And I have this slightly noisy little uh, fog volume here. Okay. Now, um, I can name it whatever I want, or I can name it den city. Now, if I name it density or lowercase, something is going to happen uh, quite mm -hmm. soon. I'm going to make a second one now going to uh, make a second one of this. And this one, I'm going to put just a spline. I'm going to turn these off because I want to focus on this. Uh, I'm going to call this temperature. And again, you can name it whatever you want. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put this over here, go to my uh, temperature. And you can see it's creating a uh, fog uh, volume around the line. You can control its density and all that and the radius and whatnot. Good, and uh, I can add some noise if I want. I can do the same stuff I did earlier. Now the question is, how do I take these two volumes, and I can move all this a bit to the front. Let me activate everything. Bring it, oh, there it is in the front. So here's the question. How can I combine these into something that is recognized as, quote unquote, a pyro volume? So what is the advice you should give everyone you know? If you want something to work, you put it under a connect object. Yes. All right? This is the advice. Your dishwasher is broken, put it under a connect object. Your splines don't show up, put it under a connect object. So this is a general consensus. But watch what happens here. Um, oh, what just happened? Well, as it happens, and this is, I would say, for me, one of the biggest unpublished features uh, that's been uh, introduced in the latest uh, few versions, that the connect object can connect volumes. And when you connect them, it actually creates a volume set which is understood by our uh, pyro system. What can we do now? Well, literally whatever we want. At this point, I can just go and create a pyro volume material, apply it to this, add my dome light because otherwise my density is not going to look good, turn it down and turn it on. And there you have it. You can actually go and create anything you want 
And now I have another question for you. You can play around with the parameters and all that. Let's assume I want a pyro that starts like this. What, who do you call? You make this editable and it will create an actual grid. You can get rid of these. You don't need these or this because everything is now recorded in here. It just keeps them for redundancy just in case you want to do something else. These are proper grids. Now, mind you, this is a bit of a thing you need to be um, aware of. Uh, because the pyro uh, shader, the pyro material, is populated with these names by default, that's why I named it as I did earlier. But you can see that you can also name them Noseman and uh, Lionel, and then just go here to the connect and put the Noseman in the density and Lionel in the uh, temperature. So it will work. I just named them as such because it will save me two clicks. And if I can save two clicks, I'm willing to spend two hours doing that. Anyhow, so what can we do now? Well, here's a nice little tricky. Make a sphere, any sphere. I'm just going to make it small because it, it irritates me. Add a little uh, parameter and turn all the parameters down. So turn this off, turn this off. It just requires an object with a pyro emitter to activate pyro, okay? You may be aware that in the pyro settings, so uh, project setting simulation pyro, there's this initial volume set. Well, this little set here is exactly what you need. Let's make this invisible. We're not gonna use that. Let's temporarily close this down and press play. And you're gonna get an initial volume with those values, and then it's gonna dissipate. And if you want to change the dissipation values, just go to your pyro, go to the, let's go to uh, density and say 1% dissipation, and zero here, uh, temperature the same, let's put one and zero and just so that the effect can stay. And look at that, you can say no temperature dissipation. So the temperature is just going to move up because of buoyancy. And the great thing is that you can even go and up the re resolution, as uh, they say in France. Vive la resolution. La resolution. Ooh, <laughs> la. See, uh, thank you. Thank you uh, for correcting me. I need to learn French. I'm in Quebec now. So there you go. You can sculpt your own volumes without using Pyro initially, and then you can use that as a, a source. And of course, then you can go and you can add your... Uh, turbulences or turbulence I, if I were David Attenborough, I would say something. Oh, come on. I've got the Sweet. renderer on. No, my problem is that I have the, the renderer on. I think that's what the problem is. Or I've been doing too many tests with... Uh, or I need your card that has uh, how many gigabytes? 32. <laughs> yeah, I crashed but my... Then, uh, there we go. Then Redshift takes everything. Congratulations, I managed to, to crash it. This is what happens when you keep doing experiments, experiments, experiments. And uh, yeah, don't forget, if but you're integrated. Yeah, with go this ahead. volume set thing, right? Um, there's also an advanced settings and initial volume override where you can then specify each channel. Then the names also don't have to match. Then you can, for example, have a fog volume named, I don't know, noise or whatever, and you can also put it in there. Wait, what? For the I'm running, I'm running through for the alien. Right, right. Guide me through this. Guide me through this. You go All to right. the simulation settings again. Simulation settings pyro. There we go. I scroll to the advanced settings. To the advanced settings. So let's close these and let's go to the advanced settings. And if you go all the way to the bottom there, you have initial volume override. Initial volume. And there you can specify fog volume or, well, whatever volume is required to override the initial volume set that you specified at the top. They have to so, be editable, though. Uh, well, it has to be a volume object or something. I think maybe Volume Builder works as well. I think it should work. Let me try. So it's going to work with, if I download a VDB, uh, VDB cloud uh, on the, in the internet. I can use it as a starting, starting point uh, to alter it. Uh. Yeah, should work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it in initial nice. density. But I, I do need an object with image. Yeah, I think that's the requirement. Okay, that's the only requirement. Just make a sphere, add a parameter on. This is exciting. 
right? Nothing. So it emits oh, nothing. Doesn't work. No, I haven't uh, pressed play yet. Oh, it doesn't work. So I have to make it editable, I assume. So um, let me make sure that I put it there. Anyway, I learned something. Oh, yeah, editable does work. Yeah, let's try it. Okay. Boom. Will this work or does it need a grid? Uh, we'll find out in a few seconds, everybody. It's already in there at least. Let's see. It needs to be a grid. Hmm. What was it, I... SDF? Oh, was it SDF? Uh, maybe if it How was, dare yeah. I? <laughs> I'm a terrible human being. I make mistakes and confuse people. I mean, I do take pleasure from it. But I know, but it still has to be editable, sorry. Editable, <laughs> good. So I'm going to make it editable. I'm trying everything here. All right, let's see. I'm going to be very impressed. I'm just going making sure it's linked properly. No way. Yeah. And I can put a different color. Whoa, what just happened here? OK. So okay. it doesn't have to name match with the density or temperature grid or something. It just has to be a volume. <laughs> OK. That was, uh, I'm lost for words. I'm lost for words. And uh, I need to find more time to dive into the new stuff. Because this is relatively uh, recent, uh, isn't it, uh, 2024? Or has it been there forever? You're Thank muted, you. man. Max, oh, you're, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, it you're was muted. introduced with the uh, apply initial state or initial state okay. feature. OK, all right, all right. I cannot remember the version it, that was. Yeah, I think it was 2023 uh, point something. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, greetings, dear humans. Uh, greetings back to you, humans. Let's see. No questions. No questions. Well, um, any other comments, Lionel? I'm gobsmacked. I'm lost for words. Honestly, I'm not. I'm not joking. Well, um, now, I, now I want to to simulate more clouds from um, you know download the VDB cloud uh, and use yep. uh, that feature to to alter to merge them to make a tornado yep. instead. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was doing some experiments with that and freezing them and and all sorts of things. So a, a little quick tip, which I think I showed in in my Cineversity simulation pyro tutorial, that you can use a field force with a zero velocity. And you can mask it using a linear field or something, and that will freeze your pyro. And if you get rid of uh, your, um, your, oh my god, dissipation, if you get rid of your dissipation, then you actually can just freeze it as it's coming down. It's an amazing effect. So uh, of course, I made a tutorial. Of course, it's amazing. But yeah, there's a, a huge potential for art directable um, pyro where you can make it look any way you want uh, to start with, uh, with the level of generation. And there is, there is a correlation between the, the units. This is the last thing I'm going to show just um, very, very quickly so people know uh, what to expect. So volume builder, don't do Max's mistake. You have to put it to fog, right, Max? Now, yes, that's right. <laughs> <But> you know, <laughs> fog volume by definition creates pretty much all ones, right? These little voxels have a value of one, and uh, that one should be as far as uh, Max told me. And if it's wrong, then it's not that I didn't understand. <laughs> if you go and you add a density of one, that it that's it. So, uh, this is you know, de 10 density, you would have to go here. And you would have to go and uh, range map it and say output 10, right? That will be the maximum value of this is the equivalent of the 10 that comes from here. For temperature, it's a bit different. Each, uh, each value of 1 is equivalent to, was that 6,500 Kelvin or something, something like that? Because we're using black body or radiation to, to do that. So the value for temperature is one of these, is the default of whatever a redshift gives you as the emission, the temperature emission. So if you go down here, you will see uh, 6,500 uh, Kelvin temperature. So it's approximately each temperature unit is 6,500 of these uh, thing medoodles here. I don't really know what that means, but I can say it with, with conviction. And uh, that's all you need to remember. You know, the, the values uh, map as you would expect them to. So you can create your own R directable uh, volumes that have a different density here, different density. You can make a different density cheese 
the, the, the cheese would be a higher density and the holes of the cheese would be a lower density. And you can make uh, SpongeBob square pants uh, made of, I don't know, Emmental or something like that. Or another French cheese that uh, Lionel will suggest. What's your cheese suggestion uh, for, for an afternoon? Mont d'Or. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. it's, a, it's a very liquid cheese. So. <laughs> nice. Very nice. So if you, if you need uh, advice on Cinema 4D or even cheese, uh, please make sure that you watch our shows. And having said that, with nothing else to say, I would um, I'd like to do my uh, housekeeping to uh, close the show and then say my greetings. Let's see. Uh, no questions. Excellent. So let me bring back my bunch of bookmarks and again go to the Max on uh, events page to see all the events that are happening now and the future and the past online and uh, in person. Um, follow us on the Max on Training Team YouTube channel and the Max on Training Team channel. I always need to remind you that if you want to watch these videos, all our shows recorded with timestamps, they're hosted on the Max on Training Team. YouTube channel. The Maxon channel only plays them live. Go to the ZBrush uh, YouTube channel and learn how to use this absolutely amazing piece of software. If you want to become certified pro user or a certified trainer, go to the Maxon certification page, click on the certification topics, which is this one over here. Now I have two of them. And not only you will see what's required in order to um, be able to uh, pass a test, uh, but at the same time, it will give you a certain guide, an overview of the stuff that we consider the stuff you need to know about Cinema 4D uh, in order to be more productive and in order to be able to solve all these very complex problems that come across us in our daily work. Uh, go grab your uh, free T-shirt, just pay for postage and uh, packaging using the passcode for November, only three days left. November goes to 30, right? Today, to, yeah, three days left and, and a bit, depending where you are on the planet. Maximum simulation, or all caps, one word. Don't forget to uh, watch the, um, I think it's somewhere over here. Where am I? Oh, anyway, next week, um, we are starting, is it next week? Yeah, in December, we are starting the rigid um, objects, the mechanical uh, rigging series for three weeks, and I have some exciting stuff to show. Go to Cineversity, watch uh, hundreds of tutorials, or go to the oldcineversity.com and uh, watch thousands of uh, great tutorials uh, that are still relevant, although some of them are quite old, but there's a lot of information to find there. And uh, having said that, I want to thank Max uh, extremely for taking the time out of his uh, busy schedule. And uh, the only reason we won't have certain features in the next installment of Cinema 4D is because Max has been sent, spending his time hanging out with us instead of programming. But, you know, everyone needs a break sometimes. So again, uh, Max, uh, jokes aside, uh, I'm really grateful for you taking the time to show us all these things. I promise that I will um, badger you with uh, questions and you will be polite as always. So thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure and honor. Lionel, thanks uh, once again for joining us. And uh, I think we'll see more of both Lionel and Max in the future. <laughs> so, uh, German, um, to all our friends uh, watching, thank you very much. We appreciate you hanging out with us and uh, watching. Uh, as always, you can uh, find me on uh, Twitter at NosemanGR. If you have any problems, any questions, simplify your scenes and DM me. Um, I usually reply to everyone, even the people that uh, write negative comments. And there's Darren. <laughs> who, who else is <laughs> All right. <laughs> we have the rest of Max on joining us. We're going to do one more hour. <laughs> no, we're not. Again. Thank you very much. Have a great day and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. See you all. Bye bye.